everyone. I'm so glad you're able to participate in our Wednesday worship again. And for the message today, I'd like to read from the book of Acts in chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. It says there, But as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas of Antioch, an earlier convert to the Jewish faith. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them as they laid their hands on them. So God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Dear brothers, if you've been watching the news and the dominant discussions on social media right now, you'll know that there's a heated debate going on about such things as racism, police brutality, and rioting and looting in many cities south of the border. And there are disagreements in the church too, what our responsibility as followers of Jesus is in confronting injustice. There are diverse opinions, whether this is mostly an American problem or a Canadian one as well, and whether violence by a few discredits an entire movement calling for repentance, change, and reform. Some are even saying that we'll always have to deal with injustice and discrimination in a sinful world. Therefore, it's hopeless to try to change any of the political wrongs. All we can do is call people to faith and salvation in Jesus, and anything beyond that is not our job. When we try to solve difficult questions like that, it's always helpful to keep coming back to the Bible and take a close look at similar situations. And I believe the sixth chapter of Acts gives us an excellent example of how discrimination in the early church was first overlooked, then pointed out, and ultimately solved, at least in the context of the Jerusalem church. Let's take a closer look at what the problem was. On the surface, the church in Jerusalem, which was led by the apostles, was highly successful. We read in chapter 2 that on the day of Pentecost alone, 3,000 people came to faith. Even if some of those were pilgrims, that did not remain in Jerusalem. The end of Acts 2 talks about the Lord adding daily to the numbers of those gathering in worship, breaking bread, and distributing food and possessions to those in need. It sounds so great and harmonious, but as the church grew in numbers and many were added from outside the Jewish community, a pattern evolved that initially escaped the attention of the church leaders. It wasn't until members of the Greek-speaking part of the church complained before the injustice became apparent. While the Hebrew widows were looked after consistently in the daily distribution of food, the Greek widows often went home and were left empty. We can only speculate what the reason of that neglect may have been. Maybe it was just a natural drift of an initially dominating Jewish culture where people had a long-standing social connection and knew each other, but had not the same connection with newcomers and therefore did not particularly care for those who still in part were looked at as outsiders. Maybe there was also suspicions that those Greek widows were at least partially to blame for being widows because of things that were particular to the Greek culture and therefore they did not feel responsible the same way they felt responsible for those they'd call them the poor for quote unquote genuine reasons. Again, I can't say for sure what the exact reasons were, but the leaders clearly were in the dark and unaware that this was even happening. I was reminded of a trip a whole bunch of people from our church took a few years ago to the Saddle Lake Reserve, 
where we heard firsthand from the band council and eyewitnesses of what happened in the residential school system and where my own eyes were open to so many things I had never heard or learned about. And I was thinking, man, I've lived such a sheltered life for so many years, but I've also been very ignorant of these deeply painful stories where injustice from the past and present has led to such things as addiction, broken families, and a shockingly high percentage of suicides. It's not easy to listen to other people's pain and becoming aware that we can't just excuse ourselves by saying we didn't know or we weren't personally involved, therefore we aren't guilty. But I believe if we really want to help and be people of good news, not just in word, but also in practice, the willingness to listen is such an important first step towards reconciliation and healing. The apostles did listen, and it didn't stop there either. They took responsibility and devised a plan to select seven spirit-filled mature deacons to remedy the situation and prevent any further discrimination. Please note that they saw this as a highly spiritual endeavor and not just a matter of logistics and a bunch of volunteers needed to be supervisors. And they were sensitive enough to choose among men of mostly Greek background in order to guarantee that the job would be done right and in a God-honoring way. They understood that these Greek widows needed special attention and therefore any pushback that could have been voiced in return, to use a more recent slogan, all widows matter, simply wasn't true until those who were being wronged received justice. And I would suggest to you that this is the primary task of the church in regards to all kinds of injustice and discrimination. We ought to demonstrate before the eyes of a watching world that by the Spirit of God, willful repentance and decisive action is possible to live out a different example than that which is prevalent in the world. God's kingdom expanding right here and right now before the fullness of the kingdom comes in the future means appreciating even the little steps towards justice, and it ought to start with us. And yes, open protest can be part of that too, as the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King's example of nonviolent protest exemplifies. Evil can be overcome with good. And every act of kindness, every tear shed for the pain of a brother or a sister, no matter what their culture or skin color may be, counts. I feel the pain of my black pastor friends in the U.S. when they are frequently stopped by police and have to fear each time whether they'll be coming home alive or not. I feel the pain of the native Canadians and Métis I've gotten to know who have many stories to tell of racist remarks and slurs towards them. But I also have to confess that I have spent very little thought in the past about how to honor different cultures present at EFC, whether they are black families, Asian families, or other non-Germans. Thankfully, we're not at a point yet where we need regular food distributions among our members. But maybe we need to actively ask those from a different background what kind of discrimination or racist behavior they have encountered. Maybe we need to listen to their stories. Maybe it would be a good idea to every once in a while honor their respective culture through songs or ethnic food that is geared towards them instead of just going with the flow of what the majority wants or is comfortable with. Maybe some of you could be part of a committee that seeks God's face and investigates further possibility of the little things we all can do to make the burden lighter and engage with justice issues right here in Edmonton. You may remember Aaron Cranton, who shared in one of our Sunday morning services the various possibilities how we can serve our homeless neighbors right here in the Old Strathcona area. There's no shortage of things we can do if we're really determined to be open to the guidance of the Holy Spirit and see where he would have us involved. Let me close with a final observation from our text. It says at the end that God's message continued to spread. Many people found Christ and became believers. 
Even many Jewish priests converted. That was the result of a church that not only refused to overload their existing leaders with too many responsibilities, but also determined to remedy injustice in their own midst. I'm not saying that filling empty benches in the church should be our primary goal and motivation, but I truly believe that a church which honors Christ, both in word and deed, and is willing to repent and change where its sins are laid bare, will be blessed and far more effective than a church that sticks its hand, head in the sand and ignores the sometimes painful facts it really needs to hear. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the way you helped the Jerusalem church to recognize and overcome their blind spots, their weakness, and the injustice in their midst. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is still trying to help us see where we may be failing to see what is unjust or discriminatory in our own lives and in our church. Give us wisdom, particularly the leaders among us, to know what to do and to take the steps to heal that which is broken. Thank you so much, Lord, that we'll also be able to meet again soon in our church building. We're so much looking forward to seeing everybody and even though it will be different and still somewhat restrictive, we're glad just to see the faces of those we have missed so much. Give us ingenuity, joy, and passion as we endeavor to be an exemplary church to the community in which we live, and that at least in small ways we can point them to you and the power of redeeming grace. And it is in Jesus' precious name that we pray these things. Amen. Yeah.